Well, Lord bless you all. Good morning. It is once again. Here we are. What is this? This is maybe like the fifth week, sixth week of of doing this um, distancing, social distancing. Has it been that long? Six weeks, five, six weeks. That's incredible. How have I been able to do this without you? That, that, that's an interesting uh, miracle there, that God has sustained us without connecting, without seeing each other. But we're grateful for the uh, technology and the method that uh, we're able to still connect with each other. And, and you know what this, this illustrates? It just illustrates just how, how badly, how desperately uh, we need each other. Think about it. God made us for this. He made us to connect. He didn't make us to distance ourselves from each other socially. In fact, uh, God said just the opposite. It's not good that man be socially distanced. It shouldn't be alone. That we're, we're designed um, for relationships and we're designed to connect. So that's why I feel so enriched when, when I'm in your presence. And I thank God for you and your faithfulness, man the family of God, as I look over the, um, start to say the audience, but uh, <laughs> over the pictures that are showing up on the, on the screen. God bless you one and all. Yeah, what a pleasure. I thank the Lord again for the wonderful Savior that we have in Jesus Christ. And each of us are sharing in the fellowship with him. And it is Jesus alone. And much of which we're, we're going to be talking some more about today, that he is the the longing of our heart and that which satisfies us. And I'm so glad for that. So glad for that. And once again, I want to thank the Lord for um, Mike, uh, Mike Jr. And the um, excellent way in which he's uh, sort of set all this up. He and, and uh, Guy are doing a marvelous, marvelous job. Just thank God for them. Uh, they they um, generally, when, when we're together at church, they're in the background. You know, you don't see them. You don't kind of, but, but you, you can, you know when they're there, you know, and we know Mike and Guy are there right now. That's why we're here, because they're doing their thing, and I thank the Lord for, for them. So they're going to usher us through this, this time together. And so with that, I, I want to wanna pray. Let's, let's enter into God's presence together by way of prayer. And Father, we are in your presence, and we're acknowledging your infinite presence and that you are infinitely aware of us. And yes, even though we cannot see you, we know, we know you, Lord. And our love for you is deepening. And we thank you for drawing us to this place. And thank you for the trials that has caused us to feel a sense of, of uh, urgency in our desire for you and for the people of God. So we bless you for this assembly and the technology and the, the men who are um, orchestrating this and asking that you'll use our time, oh God, for your glory. We want to be indeed captivated by you and you alone. So indeed, for the time that's ours, capture our hearts and you know best what each of us needs. So in our worship, in our reflection, in our sensing of, of your voice to us. We pray that the messaging, the clarity of your, your will and your words will, will um, indeed speak to our minds and our spirits. And we thank you for the power of your spirit is living in us. And thank you for the saints, every one of them that have gathered, those we see, those we, we don't see, and those that uh, perhaps can't make it. Some are in nursing homes and we're praying for them and asking that your blessing and strength and protection would continue to be upon them and so many others that are um, kind of vitally, vitally exposed, vulnerable by way of uh, the location. And yet they're safe in your hands. Nothing can happen to them apart from your will. So we pray that your will be done. We pray that you be glorified throughout this, this um, episode of human history. And thank you again as we gather in the name and for the worship of that name and that name of Jesus that's above every name. 
we worship you, Lord Jesus, and so appreciate the sacrifice of your life, your blood that was shed. You took our place. And beyond the nails, you endured the wrath of the Father. And just an incredible, incredible sacrifice of yourself. Thank you for that. And we are grateful that the tomb is empty. And because you live, we too live. And thank you again for that same power that dwells in Jesus, that raised him from the dead, dwells in us. Now be glorified in our time, we ask in Jesus' name. Well, beloved, thank you again for being here and uh, thanking the Lord for, for his uh, marvelous grace uh, as shown uh, to us through, through uh, Calvary, the cross, and the suffering. And without a doubt, the Apostle Paul uh, didn't mince words when it came to this idea of the celebration of the cross, the death of Christ, and the sovereignty of and the wisdom of God in, in sending his son. And this particular book that we're looking at now and spending our time over the next few weeks, we're looking at Second Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul does something just marvelous and that obviously through the Spirit of God. Uh, using this this uh, mighty man of God as a as a uh, persuader, um, Paul used uh, just awesome awesome gift of rhetoric to persuade minds and hearts toward the legitimacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ in all things. That uh, we are not just um, members of a religious group. We're not. We're not just members. Now, the world might view us as that, but we, we ought to know better than that. Our relationship with God is not a religious affair or affiliation. Our connection is a deep, abiding relationship, a very real authentic relationship with a person, an infinite person, and that's Jesus Christ. And yes, we are religious in how we observe our faith, but um, religion is not what we're about. We really are about a relationship. And, and that is, is the, um, the focus of Paul's rhetoric, his, 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 his uh, writing is always targeting for the believer it's, he's always targeting this uh, idea of developing the believer's um, spiritual formation as, as we look upon and gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has done no, no less here in Second Thessalonians. Here in this uh, wonderful passage, we started it last week, chapter 1. And I'm, I'm going to read several of the verses there. So I trust you, you have your Bibles with you. Um, if we were at Manna, Pastor Brown would all, always say, hold your Bibles up and uh, look at you, look at you, look at you. <laughs> God bless you all. <laughs> that is so sweet of you. Blessings to you. But here in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 3, we are, are reading Paul's words to the Thessalonian church, we are bound to thank God always for you, brothers, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other. Their faith was indicated by their growing affection and love for each other. And I must say that absence has made my heart grow fonder of, of you. In, in just a, a, a wonderful way, I, I yearn. In fact, Paul said that to Timothy, that um, he yearned for his presence while he was there in prison. He called the Philippians his, his, his longed for, his beloved and longed for. And, and you are, you're precious people. And um, there, there is a sense that our, our love is deepening and growing richer um, as we spend time together in, in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Anyway, Paul writes, as your love increases and abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all of your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. 
that they are enduring persecution because of their faith. Paul is acknowledging that, that their faith is self-authenticating because they're enduring persecution. True faith endures. It authenticates itself through the endurance, um, trials, and tribulations. And not suggesting that it's, it's easy, but certainly the Spirit of God enables us to endure um, through hard times, afflictions, trials, suffering. It's the, the Spirit of God who comes along as, as uh, he's called the paraclete. He's called alongside to help, and he, he does. He helps us, and we, we, in our weakness, he supports us. He gets us through, and it's only because of the Lord that we're able to make it. So we're able to endure because of the power of God. He commends them for that, and then he, he does something interesting in, in this verse, as we shared last week. He says, which is a manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you would be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. And so suffering and persecution for what we believe is a token, is, is a demonstration, a symbolic representation that we are fit for the kingdom. So as, as we're making and marching our way toward the kingdom, we are, we are a kingdom of, of sufferers. Suffer for the kingdom. That is the way the Lord would have it that we will enter into his presence with, with scars, with bruises, with, with scrapes, with, with all kinds of, of, of emotional um, um, trauma that we've been through and testing that we've been through because of our faith in Jesus Christ. No, no authentic believer is going to um, go into his presence with, with uh, having gone through a life of ease. It, it's just not God's design. It is design that we uh, grow and mature through through uh, trials and suffering and persecution. And, and I want you to follow with me, and then I'm going to uh, try, try to switch gears a little here. But uh, he, he says here in verse 6, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So it is God's plan. It is God's purpose to pay retribution for those who trouble and persecute believers. And some might ask, well, why not prevent that kind of suffering? Well, as I stated before, it is God's intention that, that we suffer for him. And in fact, the scripture says those that suffer with him shall reign with him. It's just part of, of the jewels that, that we will obtain for the kingdom. Um, but he will pay retribution to those who, who cause that kind of suffering. And with that in verse 7, and to give you who are troubled rest, here it is, to give you rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. I'm going to pause there just for a moment, but clearly in that passage that um, in light of the trouble, and all of the discord and the persecution that happens in, in was happening in the uh, life of the Thessalonians, Paul was projecting futuristically that there's a reason to hope, hope beyond what they see and feel, so that um, at the return of Jesus, they would know rest. What, what, um, what, what a, a wonderful concept that we, we're not going to know rest in this, in this life. Our ultimate rest is in Jesus when he returns. So if, if I can, I just want to put a, a um, um, cap or a title over this, that this idea is really about eschatology. As we, we started last week, Paul projects toward the future. And he's looking at this idea of eschatology when Jesus returns. So before I go any further, I, I want to uh, I want to just give you a, a, an opportunity here. Let me put it out there first, and then I'm going to chat a little while because I want you to respond. 
but um, please, if, if you would, I, I handed out the, a number of pages last week, and I, I just wonder if you had any questions or anything that you ran into in your review of those. I want to talk about that real briefly, but we're, then we're going to get back to our message. But I want to open the door right now to interact with you. And if you're going to do that, I would ask that you would make it known to Mike, and he's going to um, see your hand as you're, you're raising your hand. And if you, if you have a comment, um, Mike is going to ask you to kind of limit those comments or questions maybe to a minute or so. And, but we do want to give you every opportunity to interact. And the reason we're doing this, the reason why I feel like I, I, want, I should do this, is because of the nature of this study. Um, so I, I don't want to just sit here and, and pontificate, you know, just sermonize. I, I really do want the people of God to understand the scripture. So it requires teaching. And it's tedious. It does take time. And, and it takes really an absorption of, of our mind to connect with what the Spirit of God is saying in the text. So with that, I realize that eschatology, the study of of uh, future things is just so broad and it's busy. There's a lot there. And hopefully what I've, what I've done or what we've done as we've looked at the scripture and looked at the notes, we've opened up a, a vast array of, of potential questions that you might have or concerns that you might have. And if not now, perhaps as we go further in, in the message, but let, let me pause here. if. If there's anyone, let me let me ask Mike. Has anyone indicated any uh, thought or question? Or I haven't seen any hands okay. yet, Pastor. All right, all right. Um, well, let, let me did, ask you. I'm sorry. I was going to say I did add the uh, eschatology documents to the chat. Very good. And uh, ready to share the screen if you need to see that. Also. Okay. When? Yeah. I'll. I'll um, yeah. At some point, I'll, I'll appreciate you doing that. Yes, sir. Okay. So with that. Um, um, I, I'm going to pause again in, in a few minutes, but I, I want to ask, I want to share with you this this idea that that Paul's thinking regarding Jesus Christ as he's writing here to the Thessalonian church, he has what um, I am, am calling a well-defined, a well-defined and clearly developed um, worldview, a Christ-centered Christ. -centered, that he views, he understands, he sees, he discerns the world through the lens of Jesus Christ. He understands reality by looking through the lens of who Jesus is and what he has come to do. That is Paul's worldview, and it's clearly defined. So when the the Thessalonians are troubled, and we're going we're, we're gonna to see that. They're troubled because someone has written to them about eschatology and has confused them about last, what's going to happen in the last days. In fact, um, from what I understand, they thought they were living in the time of the tribulation period. So Paul writes this letter to, to comfort them and to help them to understand better about eschatology and end time things. So his understanding of the future, as far as I can determine, was not based upon circumstances. Paul's, Paul's um, worldview, his comfort was not dependent upon his, his immediate circumstances. And clearly you and I know that. How is it that a man of his stature of, of his past stature as a, um, as a Pharisee. And now, and, and at one point, he suffered in prison in a dank, dark, dismal place, writing letters. And he wrote to the church of Philippi and told them to rejoice. How could he rejoice? How do you rejoice in the midst of that kind of, of, of disgusting circumstance? And yet, Circumstances didn't dictate Paul's hope. Um, people weren't the source of Paul's hope. Um, in fact, circumstances and people do disappoint, and, and we've, we've become disenchanted uh, with, with circumstances. 
need I say any more about the coronavirus. The coronavirus has come in and changed all of our circumstances, all of us, globally. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. The more I think about it, it, it's just amazing that globally the world has has changed. And, and the, the world um, is, has been, has learned to adjust to uh, circumstances. We're learning to adjust to circumstances. Circumstances can't fulfill our hope. We, we get let down. We will be let down. People, um, you and I, as, as blessed as, as you are and as much of a blessing as we are to each other, we have limitations. We cannot be the fulfillment of what people need. We, we're not. We, we're not suited for that. It's unfair for anyone to expect that a person can be your fulfillment. No, the only person that can fulfill you is Jesus himself. And, and so we, we have a relative sense of, of, um, of, of hope that we give to each other, of, of uh, encouragement, but we, we cannot be the ultimate hope for anyone. We, we can't even be there for ourselves, <laughs> let alone for someone else. It's, it's got to be the Lord Jesus, and that, that's what um, Paul is, is um, attempting to encourage by way of his rhetoric, trying to encourage them, persuade them to think on Jesus as, as their hope. I, I really love this, um, this wonderful uh, quote by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King years ago. Um, he, he said this, listen to this. Um, he, he says, we must accept finite disappointment. Dr. Martin Luther King said we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Wow. Accept the reality that in this world, we're going to be disappointed. We're, we're going to be disenchanted with circumstances, with people, but never, Dr. King says, never lose infinite hope. And that's, that's what Paul was encouraging the believers to, to fasten their, their thoughts and their minds on. That is the hope, the eternal, the infinite hope that's in Jesus Christ in, in terms of what he is planned for the future. So he commends them for their authentic faith. But uh, he wants to stimulate their infinite hope. So he restates his teaching concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ which in scripture, once again, is it, it falls under the category or the title of a theological idea of what's called eschatology. And the word eschatology simply means last things. Eschatos is the Greek word. In fact, you'll see this, this same word in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says that in the last days, in latter days, the word there is eschatos, last days. Second Peter chapter 3, Peter says that in the last days, scoffers will come. People who, who scoff at the idea that Jesus is coming again. He ain't coming again. What do you mean Jesus? Is, see, there are scoffers that are living today. We're living in the last days. And it's, it's just so clear and apparent that the days in which we're living they're, they're not, they're not, um, they're not normal. There's this wonderful passage in Hebrews chapter one. I want to read that for you concerning the last days. It's in Hebrews chapter one, uh, starting with verse one. The, the writer says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past. So clearly, the writer of Hebrews is, is demarcating time. He, he is dividing time. He's drawing a line between the past and the present. He says in the past, God spoke in times past through various ways. He used visions. He used miracles. He used all kinds of, of marvel. He opened up Red Seas. God spoke through those miraculous events. But then the writer says, but in these last days, 
he has spoken. The word last is eschatos, eschatology. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. In the past, he used prophets and um, miracles to speak. But in these last days, he has spoke to us through his son. So we are living in the last days. The Lord Jesus Christ has inaugurated the last days. The last days started when Jesus Christ came to this earth. He came to inaugurate a new dynamic. A new, a new phase of God's plan was instituted when Jesus Christ came. So when you see passages like this, um, what, what do you think? What do you think of, of passages like this that we, we just read in these last days? And, and um, in light of recent events, um, what, has, what, what uh, has the, have these things caused you to think about? What do you think about there in your home? isolated, secluded. What would you think about? I know you're not filling your time just, you know, watching Oprah and Netflix. No, you're doing more than that. Sure you are. What, what do you think about? What, what consumes, what consumes your thoughts regarding, especially regarding these last days? Oh, I'd love to hear from you. So if you, if you have something that, that has, has um, sort of um, uh, tapped into your spirit and you'd like to share that, I'd love to hear that. I mean, because what we're looking at in regard to these last days, that the threat of, of, as we stated before, the threat of death. Think about this. We're staying inside. We're limiting our, our exposure to outside because we don't want to die. Isn't that the truth? Oh, sure it is. Sure, it's the truth. It's the truth. That's why we're, we're, we're sort of hunkered down, because we don't want to expose ourselves to death. So I know you're thinking about death. That's why you're sitting there in, in, in your home, and I'm sitting in my home, instead of us sitting in church. <laughs> you, you don't want to die. And I don't want to, well, no, I, I, I don't. I know we're going to die. But you know what? I don't want the corona to be the, man, God uses that. That's fine. I, you know, I, if I had to choose my, my way of, of dying, I'd rather go to sleep. I, I'd not wake up. You know, that to me is the best. Don't push me out of a plane. Don't push me in front of a bus. No, those are horrible ways. And I don't want the corona, right? So that's why I'm staying in the house. Please don't be offended. <laughs> but, but here we are secluded what, what do you think about it? I'm, I'm really uh, anxious to hear if, if any of you would like to share please just indicate that um, and, and if not we'll, we'll continue to go on but if you do indicate that Mike, Mike is going to let me know and I'm going to pause and, and give you the mic but uh, as, as we're thinking about uh, eschatology uh, it's this, this idea of the study of human history um, the ending, or rather, of human history, the last days, last, meaning there's an end, which means this, that you and I, as, as uh, people of the book, people of the book, we believe that human history is linear, linear, in that it has a beginning, and it has an ending. That's what we believe as, as a people of the book, because it, it, it's, just, it's just so obvious in, in the text, in scripture. In fact, in fact, the scripture says, the first page of scripture, in the what? Beginning. See, we believe in linear, in linear history. And, and then what we're, we're, we're told throughout the text of scripture is that there is an end coming. And here we are living in the last days. Uh, some think that the coronavirus is going to usher in the end of the world or maybe some nuclear bomb. No, no, no. As people of the book, what we, dis what we dis uh, discover is that those things are not going to be the end of this world. 
but that God has a plan through his son, Jesus, to bring things to the end. And I want you to see this. You, you've got to see this. When Jesus says in, in um, Revelation, look with me in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. And I want you to know this. He is quoting the Old Testament. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. And I want you to uh, keep your finger there, but I'm going to have you uh, turn in your Bibles. And uh, maybe what you ought to do is write these passages down so that you'll have them for later reflection. Um, but uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, what you'll find there in these verses, listen to this, this verse, and listen and read with me. Um, and Jesus says of himself, he's, he's self making a self-declaration, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You know what Jesus just said? Jesus says, I'm the eschatos. <laughs> I'm, I'm the beginning <laughs> and I'm the eschatos. Wow. And guess what he's doing? Let me, let me take you to another passage. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. And, and these, these are scattered throughout Scripture, particularly in, in, in Wouldn't You Know It? This is the last book of Scripture whose focus is eschatology. And who's the center of this book? Jesus. Look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 8. Jesus said, And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write these things says the first, this is what the first and the last says, who was dead and came to life. Look at that. He calls himself the first and the last. Look at chapter 22, verse 13. And then I'm going to have you to go to Isaiah. Look at chapter 22. I hear your pages. No, I don't. Actually, I hear mine. But I thank you for turning. Thank you for turning in your Bibles. Chapter 22, verse 13. Um, you, you'll see these words. I'm, in fact, I'm going to start reading in verse 12. And behold, wow, I am coming quickly. What is that? See, that's eschatology, the, the return of Jesus. And he says, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And listen to what he says in verse 13. I am the Alpha and the omega, the beginning, and the eschatos, the first and the last. What we have are, are these this, this triad of, of bipolar couplets. What did I just we have three we have three statements of Jesus, and he uses them in, in bipolar expression in, in that he's the alpha and omega. Two extremes. Alpha is one extreme. Omega is another. Beginning is one extreme. End is another. First is one extreme. And last is another. This is interesting. And what, what I, what I found, find profound is, is in Isaiah. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 40. Look at chapter 40, uh, 44, verse 6. There's several of these in Isaiah, but I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. I'm going to read there. And this is the uh, old King James. I'm starting at verse 5. To whom will you liken me or compare me to? Who will be my equal? And who will you compare me to that we may be alike? Do you see anybody that's like me? God says. They lavish gold out of the bag, and they weigh silver in the balance, and hire a goldsmith, and he makes it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship. They bear him up on the shoulder. They carry him and set him in a place, and he stands from his place. Shall he, and I'm sorry, from his place, he shall not be removed. One shall cry unto him, yet he cannot answer, nor can he save. Look at verse 9. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no else, no one else. 
So, so Israel, stop worshiping false gods. They can't help you. They can't see, they can't hear, they have no hands, they can't save you. This is what God is saying. I'm God. There is none else, and there is none like me, declaring, here it is, the end from the beginning. See, the qualification to be God is to know the end from the beginning. You, if you're God, you should be able to tell me what happened in the past, everything, and what's going to happen in the future. He says, I'm able to declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all of my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executes my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I purposed it. I think God was just highly insulted that Israel would be so low, so pathetic in their perception of what God is like, that they would lower themselves to worship that which is not even alive. And God was highly upset with them. I'm God. I will do this. I Look at the verse 12. He says, listen to me, you stout-hearted ones that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Future, future. See, Jesus quotes, he quotes the Old Testament and, and applies it to himself. The beginning and the end, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. So as far as Jesus is concerned, he is the ultimate eschatos. He is the termination of all things. He is the place where all things will terminate at his throne. And not, not just by accident. So he's not just the place where it terminates, but he's the reason why things terminate. He causes things to end. This is what Paul wants us to see. So when, when we're thinking about it, and now I'm going to flip you back. Look with me back now here at the Thessalonians. Go back with me to 1 Thessalonians, and you'll see this. Hopefully you'll, you'll see what I think I see. Um, and I thank the Lord I'm, I'm safely, um, I'm here hidden. You can't see me. So if, if I'm wrong, you, you can't do a thing to me right now. Um, I guess you're just going to have to wait, but... <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, nonetheless, I think what I think I see, I think Paul is, is honing in on the personhood of Jesus as the, as the preliminary reality of what eschatos is all about. It starts with Jesus <laughs> because he said it is. He said, I'm the beginning and the end. So therefore, the last days, the end times, start with Jesus, began with Jesus, and they will end with Jesus. Look at what Paul says here in, in first, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians, and I'm reading, starting with uh, verse 6. Look at this. He says, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when... The Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Wow. So I, I think what I see here is, is that um, the Lord Jesus is, is the, the ultimate eschatos. And so I, I want to encourage you, saints, that um, you, you need to study eschatology. You, you need to broaden, deepen your appreciation of end time things and why because jesus said he's the eschatos if you want to know him you cannot ignore this vast array of scripture that focuses in on his on, on what is clear his meticulous management of human history you can't ignore that and, and too often i think so many believers are, are, are want to be content with just the shallow, we, we just want to sort of get our, our toes into the water. 
just enough to say, I'm a Christian. When the Spirit of God beckons us, calls us, commands us to deepen our, our love and affection for Jesus Christ through the knowledge of God. That's what 2 Peter said. 2 Peter chapter 3 says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So yes, it's a big word, eschatology, but, but big deal. That's, that's not a problem. We understand what it is. Eschatology is the study of Jesus and what he's doing in the last days. That's all it, that's all it amounts to. So Paul writes this and, and, and uses the lens of Jesus Christ. He says, look, Jesus is going to give you rest when he comes back. So chill out. <laughs> Calm down. Get yourself together. It, it, it's going to be all right when Jesus comes. I, I, I think um, uh, there, there is in, in our culture a, a prevailing um, humanistic wisdom that, that seems to captivate the, the culture and the world even that uh, views, that views uh, human, human history as, as in the hands of man, that men, men can weave um, and, and choose what they want. In fact, somehow or another, we think we, think we can control the weather. Really? Come on, come on. That, no, no. We, I, I think in the prevailing sense of who we are, men have, have exalted themselves to a place of, of divine um, falsely. Think, thinking that they don't need God and they've replaced God with themselves. Um, that, that's unfortunate. But we, who are people of the book, we understand that eschatology, the study of end time things, it venerates and extols, lifts up, exalts Jesus Christ, that he is the comprehensive sovereign, that as the sovereign, as the sovereign God, he is comprehensively in control of all things. He is meticulous about every event. In fact, the Bible says, Jesus said out of his own mouth, he says, my father knows even when a bird falls to the ground. Wow. If, 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 if he's watching birds, if, if, he is so, if he is so meticulous that even birds don't fall to the ground without the knowledge of God. Certainly human history. You can't, you can't, you can't any longer look at, at the news. <laughs> when, when you sit down and look at the news, pull out your Bible. And okay, pull out your Bible and, and pull out references to the Bible. But don't just sit there in front of, of a television lapping up news and information and not filtering it through the word of God. They know nothing about tomorrow, but we know who holds tomorrow. I, I, I don't have to know what's going to happen, but I know who's in control. You know who's in control. Don't, don't just take in, take in garbage from this world. Filter it. With what God says in his word. Hope, hope is not. See, see, this is what, what Paul brings to the Thessalonians. Hope. He's coming. He's coming. And so hope is not wishful thinking. It's, it's the certainty of experiencing those things that the Lord has promised. And eschatology is the vehicle that brings hope. And who, who's in the vehicle, driving the vehicle? It's Jesus. He is our hope. Hope strengthens the resolve of the inner man to endure outward circumstances. That's what hope does. And hope, hope is stimulated through eschatology. If, if, you, if you want a, a flat-lined theology, don't study eschatology. It will flatline without eschatology. And, and I'm telling you, the saints, there are probably a lot of saints who, who, who speed past the, the idea of studying eschatology 
And, and basically what they have is just a, a flat-lined theology that doesn't have the substance of hope. And, and I'm saying to you, beloved, don't cheat yourself. Don't rob yourself. Your spirit craves hope. And the only hope, substantive hope, that you and I can have is, is in Jesus Christ and his coming. In fact, um, um, hope, hope is this idea of anticipation. It's expectation. It's the idea of validation. It's the idea of confirmation and, and participation. Look with me at this last passage, and I'm, I'm going to let you go. I'm rambling on. We'll pick this up next week, but I want you to see this. I want you to see this in Hebrews chapter 11, because we're talking about hope, and I know you're familiar with Hebrews chapter 11, but I want, I want you to see it through the lens of this word hope, because eschatology is intended to give you and I hope, expectation, anticipation, validation, confirmation, and participation. That's what hope does. Hope pulls you in. Hope will swallow you. I pray that hope swallows you up <laughs> so, so that, so that you, 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 you can no longer think hopelessly. I pray that you be uh, just, just so um, engulfed and overwhelmed with the hope that comes from knowing Jesus as the eschatos. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Are you there with me? Chapter 11, I'm going to uh, read verse 1. And then I'm going to read verse 7. And then I'm going to read verse 13. Look at verse 1. Now, faith is the substance. In fact, now all I'm doing now, I'm, I'm, into, I'm, I'm, I'm exchanging the word faith, and I'm putting in the word hope. Watch this. Faith is the substance of things what? Hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now, our hope is not this kind of wishful thinking. There are a lot of people that are hoping, hoping they hit the lottery. Not now. I know that's not anyone out there in, in our audience. <laughs> that's not the case. I know. But, but see, that kind of hope is not what, what we're reading in Scripture. See, that's a wishful thinking. What we're reading in, in Scripture is certainty. That's what the writer here is describing. He's talking about a, the certainty of anticipation, expectation, validation, confirmation, and participation. Listen to this. He says that um, faith is a substance. It's having what you hope for. It's the evidence, even though you don't see it. For by it, the elders obtain the good report. Look at verse 7. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, he prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Look at this, by faith, and I want to insert the word, by hope, what? Eschatology. By hope, Noah being divinely warned. What is that? That's anticipation. He's expected. He's being validated. It's a confirmation. And look at how he participates. He's, he's divinely warned of things yet not even seen. He was moved with godly fear. And what did he do? He prepared an ark. See, that's participation. See, in, in eschatos, what, what we do, we anticipate, we expect, expect, we want to validate, we want confirmation and participation in, in order to actively enjoy the hope that is ours by way of eschatos. It, it requires that you and I engage with, with Jesus Christ at this level of, of, uh, of understanding that he is the sovereign in control of all things. We is the word, my God, my King. Sing your praise and stand in awe. My voice, though feeble it may be, will sing your mercy and your majesty. 
Thine is the glory, God of grace. Thine is the kingdom, ancient of days, the sovereign one forevermore. Holy, holy are you, Lord of Lords. Hallelujah to the God who reigns. Worthy, worthy to receive our praise. To the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. Hallelujah to the God who reigns. We lift high your name to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. I was the hill where you were slain. Dark was the night, cold was the grave. But all that day, death took the knee. To hail you, Lord of Lord and King of Kings, King of Kings, Hallelujah to the God who reigns. Worthy, worthy to receive our praise to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah, to the God who reigns, we lift high your name, to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the God who reigns. We lift high your name to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah to the God who reigns. We lift high. Your name to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. You are worthy of all the glory. Hallelujah. And the Lord of Lords, hallelujah. Holy, 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 worthy, worthy, hallelujah. You are worthy of our praise, ancient of Hallelujah, hallelujah, worthy, 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 hallelujah, Lord. Like peering through a window blurred 
with rain. Emotions run together in a flood of doubt and pain. We pray the best we can. Now we must leave it in his hands. Yet I know when my eyes fail to see, he is able. Even though it seems impossible to me, he is able. But if he chooses not to move in the way we prayed he would, confident he's working all together for our good, I will stand upon his word. For he is able. Questions seem to haunt you night and day. How could God allow your heart to be torn this way does he listen when you call or is he even there at all yet i know when my eyes fail to see he is able, even though it seems impossible to me, he is able. But if he chooses not to move in the way we prayed he would, Confident is working all together for our good. I will stand upon his word, for he is able. Father, once again, we are just so thankful um, for the reminder of your extraordinary ability. Um, forgive us for doubting, uh, fearing, questioning, um, sometimes even suspicious of, of your move. Um, forgive us. We're so frail. We're so fearful, we're fickle, mm. <laughs> our thinking is just so foggy at times. Mm. Mm. And uh, things like Corona comes along and, mm. and just causes us to tremble. Mm. Forgive us. We are grateful nonetheless that you come to the table with an extraordinary resume of your ability. 
You're the beginning and the ending. You're the first and the last. Mm -hmm. You are he who was and is and is to come. Mm -hmm. There is nothing too hard for you. Yes, Find us as your people this week, enjoying, basking in, bathing ourselves in the extraordinary Son of God, the Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. and that which he's doing in this world. Find us participating with you as we anticipate, as we look for that uh, sky to break forth. We pray, oh God, that our hearts would be yearning for you and longing for you, and longing and expecting mm -hmm. a new reality to be mm -hmm. ushered in with your return. Thank you so much, Jesus, for our time. And now, unto him. Hallelujah. Who is able. Yes. Who is able. To do exceedingly and yeah. abundantly above all that we ask or even think, we cut you short, Lord. <laughs> uh, forgive us for not asking big. You're a big God. Nothing too hard for you. And it's unto you that we commend our spirits for this week to whom belongs all the glory, both now and forevermore. We the redeemed of God say amen. 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 Happy birthday, Jackie. Happy birthday, Jackie.